just to uh, just to verify my identity. I'm, I'm the right person, I think. Yeah. Have you ever come across this little puzzle? A programmer's wife asks the programmer, could you please go shopping and get a carton of milk? And if they have eggs, get six. So the shop had eggs. What did the programmer come back with? Six carton of milk. Of course, of course. Because this is how programmers think. You know, and not, not only programmers, but technical people in general. It's not just the, the programmer's problem, it's a, it's a technical problem. What I'd like to share with you this morning is, this afternoon, is um, the idea of getting out of your technical box and thinking from a slightly broader perspective, uh, realizing that business people or normal people, as my wife calls them. When I introduce my wife to a, a colleague, and she's, she's very polite, but she says afterwards, don't you know any normal people? <laughs> so illustrating the differences between business people and, and, uh, and IT people. And I think one of the things that we in IT have is the, is the desire to make perfect solutions. And that takes a long time. Whereas the business is often satisfied with something that is imperfect tomorrow or today. So that's balancing those two things. And also it's very important to realize that the business plays, and, and as we saw, some of you who, who saw the previous session where we had the agile theater, the business has a very active role to play in, uh, in, in IT uh, development and management. So encouraging the business to play an active role and, and be better business IT drivers, better dr drivers of the car, you could say. Um, I had the pleasure of talking at uh, conferences at about, in about 20 countries around the world. And what I've sort of summarized, the things that people talk about, what, what they're dealing with is the speed of business change and the unpredictability of change the complexity of information systems, and systems seem to be getting more and more complex, which de demands a different way of looking at things. The third one is the, the immaturity of demand management, and I mean with demand management, the role that the business plays. What do we need? And often you see the IT is fairly well developed in terms of maturity, but the business is is lagging behind, so the business is the weaker, the weaker link. We need to get them up to up to the same level. And finally, and this will be one of the main topics today, the uh, the, the troubled relationship between um, business and IT. You know, these you know, these IT people are weird, and the other way around. So it depends on your your perspective. This is. Um, this is my career. This is what I call my visual CV. And you can see I've, I've plotted it on the happiness axis. I started off as a program at 100% happiness, and then got seduced into taking on management responsibilities. You know how it goes. They say, Mark, you're a great programmer. Why don't we promote you to a management role where you can, you can uh, develop until you're incompetent? <laughs> It's the, the Peter principle, developing until you're, you reach the level of incompetence. And, and this was the most important part in my career, taking the decision to leave behind the status of, of a minor director's role and focus on content, because I'm a content guy. And uh, as a consultant, I, I now call myself the IT paradigmologist which I hope you've heard for the first time, because I, I thought up the term, the, the I, because I study IT paradigms, IT paradigmology, study of IT. And an IT paradigm is really just a, a pair of glasses, a way of looking at the world. And I find it fascinating how, how we have changing perspectives on how we look at IT. Really, uh, really very interesting. I, I'm self-employed at smalley.it, where you can find me, mark at smalley.it. And I'm, uh, I'm affiliated with several organizations, the main one being, and I spend about half my time working for the not-for-profit ASL BSL Foundation, which is a membership organization and where we've collected best practices 
on application management, I'll be talking about that tomorrow, and also information management from a business perspective. We have two frameworks, which I won't bore you with, they're called ASL and BSL, and if you're interested in those, talk to me afterwards. This, is based on, uh, this talk is based on a white paper. If you're interested in reading it, you'll find it fairly easily just by looking for the keywords. And some people, uh, some people enjoyed um, the thoughts that I had. And it's about relationship, communication, differences, understanding each other's <coughs> different perspectives and getting value out of them. And it's, um, well, I call it uh, IT is from Flatland and business is from Spaceland to illustrate that they're different different dimensions and I'd like to uh, I like to illustrate that this with a little video clip welcome to flatland a world of only two dimensions only forwards and backwards left and right in this world there is no up and no down Where's Dottie? He said, well, she's out in line. <laughs> <laughs> what the creep is that thing? <laughs> in this world, the two-dimensional beings that live here have no concept of three-dimensional objects. These two-dimensional flatlanders have no understanding of cubes, spheres, tetrahedrons, or Yours truly. From their 2D perspective, my 3D finger looks something like this. <gasps> oh, what the matter is that? Hello, little circle. Uh -uh. Fear of the unknown, or should I say, not yet known. It's a puzzle. If we see only what we know, how does anyone ever see anything new? The unknown. How do we ever get out of our box? How do we ever get out of our box? And you can uh, you can look at this uh, look at this video clip uh, readily available. Uh, the from, from that topic to something quite strange. I've, you can see this toilet roll is, has accompanied me around the world. I think f it's seen four continents, so it's, it's looking a little bit tired. But the question that I've asked to, I think, a couple of thousand people now uh, is, what is the right way to hang up a roll of toilet paper? Is it with the flap on the outside? or the flap on the inside. So I'd like to get the, the Estonian point of view on this. Who says the, the right way is the, the flap on the outside? <laughs> and the flap on the inside, apparently the, the minority, or people who aren't brave enough, right, good. I can, um, I can reassure you, based on my international research, that this is normal. <laughs> Most people say on the outside, but, and I think particularly technical people. The interesting thing, technical people have a reason for saying they think about these kind of things. They don't just do it, they think. Why? Because it keeps it clean, it's easier to grab, there's a, there's a, a system behind this. And it's, it's really it's the same with, a, with a, um, a tube of toothpaste. What is the right way to squeeze a tube of toothpaste? It is, of course, for technical people at the end, not in the middle. Um, what's the right way to crack open an egg? How do you park a car with the front in or the front out? I always park with the front, the front going out because usually when I go to a meeting I have more time before the meeting so I've I think about these things. have time to park the car in the right direction when I get out of the meeting and um, I'm away quickly. But we, unfortunately we think about these things and you can you can see this difference if you look up the test SQEQ, that's systemizing quotient and empathy quotient, you can do a test and establish your systemizing quotient and empathy quotient. And the systemizing quotient is 
really about your, your interest in systems, in analyzing things. And whereas the empathy quotient is the ability to sense, to empathize with people, understand their behavior, sorry, understand their feelings, and also your ability, your tendency to be affected by other people's feelings. Some of, our, uh, some of us are within IT, but business people often say IT people don't have many feelings. Interesting to do this, um, and often business people have a higher EQ and uh, technical people have a, a higher SQ. There's a professor who's done some research on this and he's determined that if you take a test and you look at the difference between your SQ and your EQ, that, will, that is a good indication of your ability to program. High SQ, low EQ, you'll be a good program. <laughs> He's proved it. So it's um, making a, making a, so what, what, what have we got here? Mars, yeah, right, Mars, and I can see some people, I think, knowing what's coming up. Venus and Mars. And I'm gonna make a, make a couple of statements which might get rotten tomatoes thrown at me because they're possibly a politically incorrect statement. But refer has anybody read this book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From... It's, it's quite interesting. It takes, a, takes an interesting perspective on, on, on men and women. Uh, the, um, one of the cases is when, when something goes wrong, a problem occurs, what is the typical female reaction and the typical male reaction? So, ladies, when something goes wrong, what do you want to do? Blame the man. Blame the man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, often, certainly in my experience, women want to talk about the problem. What do men want to do? Oh, want to fix the problem. Right, want to fix it. So do you want to fix it or do you want to talk about it? <laughs> so, an illustration of that. He doesn't deserve you, Audrey. He really doesn't. <laughs> Exactly. I know you have. I know. <laughs> I know. Oh, I know. You were like that all night. What was that, Audrey? Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. Well, why is she telling you then? I understand you. I really do. Oh, I can't stand it anymore. So, got a great example of, of somebody with a high empathy quotient, empathising with the with the person on the other on the other end there. So the thing you do want to fix it or talk about it. Men want to fix things. I think we just established that. And technical men want to fix things with things. We love tools. That's that's just. Ex please excuse us, ladies. That's our way of our way of doing things. But a very serious point, if you realize, ladies and gentlemen, if you realize that men have this tendency to want to fix things instead of want to, want to empathize with you, then you get a better understanding. And the other way around, gentlemen, if you realize it's not about solving the problem, it's about empathizing with, with the lady, that generally helps in the, in the relationship. And that's one of the key messages in that book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. A topic, change management, closer to the IT industry. Men marry women with the hope that they will never change. Whereas, women marry men with the hope that they will be changed by the women. Now, who came up with this? And of course, they, inevitably, they're both disappointed. Albert Einstein, what about that? There's some, uh, some, some great human insight there. Another, and I think this is the final illustration of the, of the politically incorrect differences between men, men and women. Men's brains are, are very unique. Men's brains are made up of little boxes. And we have a box for everything. We've got a box for the car. We've got a box for the money. We've got a box for the job. We've got a box for you. We've got a box for the kids. We've got a box for your mother somewhere in the basement. We got, we got, we, we got boxes everywhere. And, and the rule is, the boxes don't touch. When a man 
discusses a particular subject. We go to that particular box, we pull that box out, we open the box, we discuss only what is in that box. All right? And, and, and then we close the box and put it away being very, very careful not to touch any other boxes. <laughs> now women's brains are very, very different from men's brains. Women's brains are made up of a big ball of wire. <laughs> and everything is connected to everything. <laughs> the money's connected to the car, and the car's connected to your job, and your kids are connected to your mother, and everything's connected to everything. It was just like... <laughs> I think there's a grain of truth in that. <laughs> so men's brains, women's brains. And the, I think there's, a, there's a, a great comparison between business people and IT people. And th this is a cartoon by one of our industry colleagues, Paul Wilkinson, who also draws stuff. And here, the, the business and IT needed, needing a, a marriage advisor, a marriage counselor to, uh, to resolve their, their differences. So, Thinking about uh, the differences between business people and IT people, what do you think that business people think about IT people? What kind of characteristics do they uh, tell about us? They're smart. They're smart. You, yeah. <laughs> you wish. <laughs> Nerds. Nerds, yeah. Lack of social. Lack of social skills. Weird. Weird. <laughs> yeah. Stubborn. Stubborn. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. The, these are some points that I've collected from uh, from previous exchanges with the audience. Bureaucratic and slow. We like to think in terms of processes and procedures, although agile is changing that. We speak in techno babble. They don't understand us. We think that we know what they want but we don't really have a clue. And often, they are the la when things go wrong with IT systems, they, we are the last people that the help desk is the last resort of call. Although we always promote help desks with these kind of wonderful pictures of friendly people, whereas reality is more like this. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a poor reputation. I've asked some industry colleagues, uh, these are from North America, the first two from the US, this guy from Canada, and it, this ties in very nicely with the previous talk about Agile, talking about value. <coughs> talk in terms, when you talk to the business, talk in terms of benefits, costs, and risks without mentioning anything in IT. If you can do that, it's wonderful. And business, the business has high expectations. I don't want questions. I don't want you coming to me with a piece of paper and ask, writing down what I say. I want you to understand my business and give me answers. And possibly a typical North American, US-based opinion, the business says, I'm entitled to IT. So I expect from the IT department you're going to deliver and I don't have any role to play, which I think isn't the case. Uh, Professor Jerry Luffman, who's done lots of research on this, says IT doesn't understand the business, but the business's understanding of IT is even worse. So he's sort of bring this bring this into into balance. So let's have a look at it from the uh, from the other perspective. What do we think about the business? So I think this question should be easier. What do we IT people think about business people? Bureaucrats. You bureaucrats. <laughs> What else? Unrealistic. Unrealistic. Yes. Unrealistic expectations. Here's a collection of stuff. They don't know what they want, always changing their minds, won't take responsibility, never satisfied, and then blame us for everything. It's just not fair. They blame <laughs> us for everything. I think this is a very good representation of the relationship between business <laughs> and IT. 
as it's perceived by uh, IT people. And there was, um, I thought this was a great quote, uh, an Indian, in, Indian industry colleague of mine, the business knows no logic. Um, of course, IT is all about logic. And well, you know, when you think about logic, who's the first person you think about when you think about logic? Logical. Remember this guy? Well, Mr. Spock, they didn't stay frightened very long, did they? The most illogical reaction. When we demonstrated our superior weapons, they should have fled. You mean they should have respected us? Of course. Mr. Spock, respect is a rational process. Did it ever occur to you they might react emotionally? With anger? Doctor, I'm not responsible for their unpredictability. They were perfectly predictable. To anyone with feeling. I'm not responsible for their unpredictability. This is wonderful. The classic, the classic challenge, you know, the McCoy and, and Spock, one of the classic, uh, classic couples. So we've got that IT is logic. We are often accused of making, building perfect systems for an imperfect world. I think that's a very, very good point. The world is unpredictable, is irrational. Uh, the, the, there are contradictions in the world, yet we want to build perfect systems. So we need to balance that, um, that conflict. So, you, know, you could say building digital systems for an analog world, but how do we resolve that, that conflict? So, that understanding thing. I've, I've done lots of, uh, f forgive me for, the, for all the detail here, I'm leaving this because it might be interesting to look at afterwards. This is based on workshops I've done in six or seven countries, talking to people. I, do, I divide them up into two halves. I say, you're, bu you're business people, you're IT people. Business people, what kind of behavior do you want from your IT colleagues so that you two can collaborate and deliver value? And, of course, I ask the IT people, what behavior do you want from your business colleagues so that you can collaborate better? And they come up with these kind of things. Business people should specify outcomes. <laughs> what do they want to achieve rather than say, we want this solution. They should set priorities, take decisions. Also, referring to your, your point sir, about the understanding, they should understand the IT's capabilities, what's possible and what's impossible, because that's, uh, that's very important. On the other side, uh, IT should have an very good understanding of, of the business, the processes, the outcomes, and the impact that IT has on that, and be, move into a more proactive role rather than just waiting for the business to, uh, to say something. It, this, you, you might take, like to take a look on, on, at it afterwards, and there's also a link here to a little blog I wrote on it with some more detail on that. Your technical people, what's, what's this? Steering mechanism. Steering mechanism, right, okay. So here we've got the steering wheel. And what's this? Power steering. Yeah, power, yeah, power steering. And I think this is a great metaphor for the role that, that, that IT can play. IT plays the role of power assisted steering. Business steers the car, it's up to IT to make it easy for the business to take decisions. That's a, that's a nice little metaphor. I like car metaphors. They often backfire on me, but I think that that's... You've got another one here. You could say the road represents the underlying architecture and governance of IT. Then we have the car, which is uh, um, the product of IT supply. The IT department is in the business of providing great cars. but. If you don't have competent, drive, competent drivers who know where they're going, you get absolutely no value out of them. So I like to emphasize the role, and I, I say we, we talk about demand, the business wants something, IT supplies it, and then the business uses it, and only when using it do you actually get value out of all the work that's gone before. That's the only point where value actually gets realized. And it's very interesting to think about how well do users use the systems? Do they use them as the systems were intended? Are they actually realizing value out of the investments? And there's some surprisingly very little research done on this, but I found some research where they said that uh, between 4 and 10%, on average 7.6%, 
business productivity is lost. Business productivity is lost due to problems in IT. 8% pro business productivity is lost. Half of that, slight, slightly more than half of that, is due to problems in the systems themselves. The other half of that business productivity loss is due to users not knowing how to use the systems properly. Now, if you think about how significant that is, if you realize that IT costs as a proportion of total business costs or maybe two, three, four, five percent, yet you could achieve four percent extra productivity by improving how the users use the systems. It's really something to think about. And who is paying attention to the users? Who is ensuring that the users actually use the systems well? Looking at this from the business point of view, I think the business is thinking about these kind of questions. How much should we be investing in IT as opposed to other business resources, business assets, like people, like buildings, like machines? So how much should we invest in IT? How, how well, how, are we making the right investments within IT? Uh, how well are you, the business, delegating it to the IT department? That's often quite a diff as we saw in the previous, the previous Agile theatre, it's difficult to delegate work to IT, so how well does the business do that? How do they ensure that the users actually use the systems well, and get value out of them? How do they protect the information that is uh, often very sensitive? And if the enterprise is in a fairly highly regulated environment, so you're talking about strong governance, how can the business demonstrate that this very important asset, information, that they're managing that properly? And that's in our foundation, one of our interests is developing capabilities to help the drivers know where they want to drive the car and, uh, and drive it in the right direction. And we have a we have a little pocket guide. Our publisher, Van Haren, has kindly given me a free link to this, uh, this PDF of this book. If you're interested in that, uh, take a picture of it, look it up on the, on, the, on the slides, or send me an email, and I'll send you the link. That was the presentation that I published on the site. I have a second presentation because I've recently got involved in this, and this is going to take about five or ten minutes, so just sort of fill it up nicely. Um, so I, don't, I don't need the, uh, <laughs> the, my attribute anymore. This is a topic that I first talked about three weeks ago in New Orleans at a, an IT conference in, in the States. They had a competition for students at the, at the conference, and the students were at the conference a couple of days before the start and they wanted somebody to deliver a workshop uh, to the students and I volunteered and I had great fun, to, four universities, 12 students, and we talked about lots of topics including digital ethics. And I'd like to, um, I'd like to introduce that with a couple of, <laughs> a couple of clips. Are you familiar with the trolley car dilemma? This is a couple of you are. This is about a trolley car on a track, and it's out of control. And the, there's the choice of going down one track and killing a number of people, or going down another track and killing fewer people. And this, this is explained by uh, Michael Sandel, who is really specialized in this topic. This is a course about justice, and we begin with a story. Suppose you're the driver of a trolley car, and your trolley car is hurtling down the track at 60 miles an hour, and at the end of the track you notice five workers working on the track. You try to stop, but you can't. Your brakes don't work. You feel desperate because you know that if you crash into these five workers, they will all die. Let's assume you know that for sure. And so you feel helpless, until you notice that there is, off to the right, a side track. And at the end of that track, there's one worker working on the track. Your steering wheel works, so you can turn the trolley car, if you want to, onto the side track, 
killing the one, but sparing the five. Here's our first question. What's the right thing to do? Right, so there you are. In the trolley car, if you do nothing, you're going to kill five people. The trolley car will kill five people. You have the, you have the opportunity to turn the wheel, change the direction of the trolley car, and kill one person. Who's going to turn the wheel? Okay, so, okay just, just to make sure that we eliminate the people who don't put their hands up. And who would, who's going to do nothing? Yeah, honest, good, good. So I think we've got, we've got twice as many people who, who take action and kill one person um, as opposed to people who say, I'm, I'm not involved, it's going to happen and I'm just going to let that happen. I, I think this is a common answer to the problem. Now we have the next situation. This time you're not the driver of the trolley car, you're an onlooker. You're standing on a bridge overlooking a trolley car track. And down the track comes a trolley car. At the end of the track are five workers. The brakes don't work. The trolley car is about to careen into the five and kill them. And now, you're not the driver. You really feel helpless until you notice, standing next to you, leaning over the bridge is a very fat man. And you could give him a shove. He would fall over the bridge, onto the track, right in the way of the trolley car. He would die, but he would spare the five. Now, how many would push the fat man over the bridge? Raise your hand. Right. Who's going to push the fat man over the bridge? <laughs> you. <laughs> Couple of people. Ruthless. You're ruthless. Are you, so you get thinking, so what's the difference? It's, it's five or one. So what's the difference? It's criminal difference. Yeah, sure. You kill your murderer, otherwise you are just spectating. Yeah, that's right. So it, it's, the, it's the degree of participation. But it, this, is, this is really a very difficult topic. Now, he's got a couple of other, other uh, illustrations which we'll, consi which we'll skip. I want to get onto the, onto the digital ethics because we're moving into the area of self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles. We had examples this morning, the keynote about unmanned ships. So picture the scene, you're, you're the, in a self-driving car and suddenly you find yourself on a road and with pedestrians who suddenly appear and there are concrete walls on both sides of the roads uh, of the road and so there's the option of either this is of course this is worst case scenario it's too late to to stop because that's what you should do first too late to stop so you have the choice should the car go down the road into the pedestrians or should it drive into the wall with the worst case scenario of killing the driver and the occupants. So the question is what's, what's the, I have really I have two questions. I'm less interested in the answers and more interested in just leaving you with the questions because this is something that we are going to be confronted with. Somebody has to program the software somebody has to take a decision. So, what's the right thing to do? That's one question. And the other question is, and who should be taking this decision? Yep. Random. Sorry? Random. Random. Ran <laughs> <laughs> well, pro yeah, program that. Yeah. If then maybe. Not if then else. There's, um, I, quoted the, the, the source down the bottom, you can, you can read that article, it's quite an interesting article on, on, the, on the findings. And, and the students in New Orleans that I talked with about this topic, they came up with more or less the same answers. Most people thought that the, the car should drive into the wall, sacrifice the driver in order to save, um, 
save others. They, they thought this particularly if they were not the driver themselves. So we're talking about other people, which is much more easy. So it's the tip people tend to the greater good, um, but it's, it's a difficult topic. The question is, should the manufacturer take these, this decision, or should, should the driver be offered with an option in the car, a menu to choose from? Yeah. You know, these, you can imagine, this could be programmed. Is this ethical to give the driver a choice? No, no, the cheaper cars will kill you and expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so you buy safety, yeah, the cheaper cars kill you. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a different question. Yeah. Would you drive a car if you knew it would take you? Yeah, excellent. No, that's an excellent. That's, that's thinking out of the box. Excellent point there. Would you drive a car with these kind of cases? So you, well, but it's really it's moving us into this moral domain, digital ethics. What is the right thing to do? Is it, is it moral to buy a car like that? Is it moral to choose these kinds of decisions, and who's going to take the decision. Now, if you look at what, and I'm rounding it off now, um, the example of Tesla and Volvo. Tesla, <coughs> recent, this, 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 I think this is within the last month, because this is real, this is happening at the moment. People are moving into this space and being forced as manufacturers to take positions on what are we going to do. And Elon Musk says, he should not hit, hit the pedestrians, hopefully. So he's, he's indicating it's, uh, they're not there yet. The driver is still liable. The driver cannot abdicate responsibility. So you've got the same, as you just pointed out, the responsibility to either to choose or not to choose to, to drive in a car like that. But he says, in the future, something will happen. Volvo have taken a much more aggressive very brave point of view. We are the suppliers of this technology and we are liable. Can you imagine a CEO saying that? We are liable. That's a major statement. This is a very brave statement. And he's challenging the competitors in the industry. He said, if you are not ready to make such a statement, you shouldn't move into the area of self-driving cars. So it's, I think that hopefully leaving you with something to, to, to think about during, uh, during lunch. A fascinating topic, and you are the future. You are going to be taking these decisions, so I, I, have, I, have, I have great confidence in you that you will protect my future. Thank you very much.